Good evening. Happy New Year to you all. For our first match of the day of 2008, we've got six games for you with the Barclays Premier League's top three all in action. We'll also have top punditry from Alan Hansen and Mark Lawrenson. Well, that was their New Year's resolution. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Before the football, prior to every Premier League game today, there was recognition for Phil O'Donnell, who tragically died after captaining Motherwell on Saturday. We start at match of the day at Old Trafford where the champions Manchester United faced Birmingham City. The commentator was Steve Wilson. Sir Alex Ferguson turned 66 yesterday but is banned from the dugout for the clash with another of his former players. Alex McLeish won nine trophies under Sir Alex at Aberdeen. No room for error today after Manchester United's surprise defeat at West Ham. Will Birmingham feel the heat of a backlash? Well, Ferguson makes five changes. Brown, Hargreaves, Fletcher, Giggs and Sahar are left out. There's still no Rooney. O'Shea, Anderson, Nani, Carrick and Park G. Sung come in. Park for his first start since March. Birmingham are without Johnson, who has a fractured cheekbone. Mehdi Nafti returns. And Gary O'Connor starts for the first time in the league since mid-August. It's one day short of 30 years since Birmingham last won on this ground. O'Shea. Kenny just got there ahead of uh, Ronaldo, but Evra's onto it. And now Evra bursts goal side. Good ball in! Tevez off the post. Evra onto. The head of Carlos Tevez onto the post. <laughs> Nicely from Muamba to McSheffrey. And he's come inside Vidic. Oh, and it almost came off Vidic into the path of Jerome. It was nearly a great chance for Birmingham to take a shock lead here. McSheffrey made it hard and then Vidic just played it almost into... Look how close Jerome was. Carrick, Nani. That's a lovely ball in, well dealt with by Jaidi, but look at the room for Ronaldo! Well, a clear opportunity for Cristiano Ronaldo, made by the quality of the ball in from Carrick. Jaidi had to deal with it, and that meant that Ronaldo was left. Look how this dipped. His uh, New Year and his birthday all rolled into one yesterday. 66 now, Sir Alex. Rio Ferdinand for Manchester United. Nani. Oh, it's a really good effort. Well hit, it was curling and it's only about six or eight inches wide. Returning from this long injury layoff, it's Park to Anderson, to O'Shea, to Anderson for a corner. It's Nani to take the corner. Oh, 
Vidic got something on it. It's a big appeal for handball as Ferdinand swept it towards goal. Kadru got ahead on it. Nafti with half a clearance. Well, There's a big shout mainly from Rio Ferdinand, actually. I think it would have been harsh. Ferdinand underneath this with Jerome. O'Shea. Rio Ferdinand, Cameron Jerome down at the moment for Birmingham. Manchester United are playing on here and they found Carlos Tevez. Birmingham won't be happy if United score from this and they're going to. I think it's Tevez. They have. <laughs> Carlos Tevez scores the goal. It's a peach of an assist from Cristiano Ronaldo. But meantime, Cameron Jerome is still down for Birmingham City. <laughs> Well, he's no dummy, is he, Carlos Tevez? He took it nicely. But it was the baby face Cristiano Ronaldo with that assist that made it easy. But there is controversy about this because Birmingham's Cameron Jerome is down. Nicely finished by Tevez to put Manchester United in front. But here is the challenge. He leapt with Rio Ferdinand and he hurt his thigh as he dropped to the ground, Cameron Jerome. Manchester United under no obligation to put the ball out. And Alex McLeish ends up falling a goal behind to Carlos Tevez. Here's Anderson. Carrick. Ridgewell's foul on Carlos Tevez. It's going to be a yellow card here for Liam Ridgewell. He's already served one suspension this season, Ridgewell, for accumulating five yellows, and that's his sixth for the foul on Tevez. Still limping. That's a mistake by Carrick. Now Larson, now Jerome, O'Connor in the middle. Larson and McSheffrey too. Cameron Jerome here for Birmingham. Tees up Muamba. Muamba works it wide. McSheffrey. McSheffrey off target. Just hurried it and snatched at it, McSheffrey. Been a fairly comfortable afternoon for Vidic and Ferdinand at the back. And Ferdinand's found Park Ji Sung with an expansive ball. And that's a great cross! Oh, it's a good save by Taylor to deny Ronaldo. Really good save. Don't often get the chance to see just how good in the air Cristiano Ronaldo is, because he's almost always wide, but that was a really good header. Park Ji-sung here. Tevez. Oh, brilliant from Tevez. How did he do that? He's in the post. Ronaldo finds room. He's still going. Oh. Blocked in the end by McSheffrey. Cristiano Ronaldo. With an astonishing dribble through the most packed of penalty areas. Denied in the end by Gary McSheffrey. After Manchester United had hit the post after his own bit of brilliance from Carlos Tevez. Look at Ronaldo now. Beats one, beats two, beats three, and then hits McSheffrey. Tevez. Carrick. Nani. Tevez in all kinds of space, too much space. Taylor got a hand to it, O'Shea couldn't deliver. Ridgewell can clear. That was a good piece of goalkeeping by uh, Mike Taylor, Taylor to keep it away from O'Shea. Oh, 
Nafti through to Forsell. Now can he get the better of Vidic and Ferdinand? Mikhail Forsell's done well with this. Still Forsell. Trying to get it wide to Kelly. Nani was there. Suddenly there's a little bit of anxiety about Old Trafford. Nafti. Larson is there. Larson to Forsell. Forsell onto his right foot. Well, the warning signs are there for Manchester United. They've had the game almost entirely their own way for something like 70 minutes. They've scored only one, and now they just might be at risk. Here's De Ridder. Ferdinand's header falls to Forsell. Oh, he had Larson to his right. He had O'Connor to his right, and he went for goal with what was always going to be a difficult shot to execute. Well, he's in a good position, but not as good a position as those to his right-hand side. And this now must be the last throw of the dice. Rio Ferdinand is there, and Manchester United have the points that they ultimately deserve, but Birmingham City have a great deal of credit here. They frustrated and frustrated and then had a right go at Manchester United in the last 15 minutes of the game. Alec beaten today, but certainly not disgraced. Certainly not. It's a disciplined performance. Um, we a wee bit of luck, we rode the storm at the start of the second half and we ended up, I thought, I really had a good feeling that we were going to nick something. When we don't score the second goal, uh, it, it always happened. The other team keep the motivation, the belief. They knew that uh, in football uh, and they know that uh, everything can happen. Please have a clean sheet, to be honest, yeah, after conceding two sloppy goals uh, um, in the last game. But um, you'd like to have got a few more goals to kind of cushion it towards the end. So it wasn't to be, but sometimes you've got to grind results out and we managed to do that today. We saw Carlos Tevez, your uh, goal scorer, carried down the touchline at the end there. What news on his injury? Well, uh, the tackle was, uh, was really tough and was uh, not, a, not a nice one. But uh, we hope that everything will be fine tomorrow. At the end uh, of the game, he was struggling a little bit, but we keep the hopes uh, high. He's fine, he's just been <laughs> rocked like a baby yeah, yeah. when he had the, the dummy in his mouth. And all the that. I mean, it was stood. tighter than it looked like being for a long time, mm. but three was, points nevertheless. It was a funny sort of game because at times Manchester United, the quality of the football was breathtaking, at other times, distinctly average. Ronaldo individually, at times out of this world, other times he just gave it away for fun. Pretty home for 10, 15 minutes, and then United get the goal. Second half, could have been five, six, seven up, but failure to get the second goal always means the last 10 or 15 minutes is going to be edgy. I thought that Birmingham, Birmingham defended heroically, and in the end, they might have got something out of the game. Yeah, could well have done. I mean, the goal when it came was a bit of genius well, in there, although an element of con controversy. Well, I'm have... not so sure. I mean, people would say, is this a foul on Jerome? Ferdinand gets up, he's aggressive, he goes for the ball. Jerome goes down, should they kick it out? Well, it's hit his side. He's got an injury to his side, not his head. They play on, but next it's sublime. Tevez plays it into Ronaldo, the back heel, the movement, and then the eyes to finish it off. Just absolutely fantastic play. And a goal worthy of winning any match yeah, whatsoever. Goal, yeah. right? Brilliant goal, absolutely United brilliant. United were largely dominant, but in the end they could have paid, as you said, for their profligacy. Well, the thing is, if you don't get the second goal, we've seen it time and time again, you will get edgy the last 10, 15 minutes, and... You know, chance after chance game. Park done the right hand side. How many times have we seen this? Ronaldo not only brilliant in the deck, but brilliant there. People say he should have scored. I think it's a great save, but they keep it a little bit unlucky. This one, they're swarming all over Birmingham. Four against three. He just picks the wrong option there and hits it and hits off Ridgewell. And then the next one, into Tevez. He's down, he's still down, he's up, he's close, he hits it off the post. Then Ronaldo tries to beat 15 men here and walk it in. Shades of George uh, Best. Well, exactly, and Birmingham just do ever so well to block it. And then this is what happens in the end for Sell, who'd come on, that could have gone in. And then he should, for Sell again, should have done better. There's five forward here, and if he's just a little bit of composure and picks a colleague out, they could have been in. 
But Manchester United, that Manchester United yeah. deserve to win the match. Yeah, yeah. yeah. tough yeah. little run for Birmingham. I mean, Manchester United, Arsenal, Chelsea, three games on the bounce. But McLeish making his mark. Well, very much so. I thought um, certainly today and last week that they've improved considerably. I think that when you're talking about the big games coming up, you're better having them this side rather than having them like April and, and early May. So if Alex can get these games at the win and, and make a little bit of progress, he's, I, I think they'll be fine. I don't think they've got a problem. Yeah, you feel that Birmingham will beat the teams around them in that mini-league. I think they'll be OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Uh, with United winning, Arsenal needed to secure a victory over West Ham to stay top of the Premier League. The Hammers are the only side to have beaten the Gunners at the Emirates Stadium. Jonathan Pearce saw this one. Emmanuel Abue, one of four Arsenal changes, and Colo Torre played their last league game before leaving for the African Cup of Nations. Arsene Wenger won't be rushing into the market to replace them. Freddy Ljungberg passed a fitness test to face his old side. Pantzel and Ferdinand come in. West Ham conceded just six away league goals this season. A record only matched by Liverpool. Mullins has given it away to Cesc Fabregas, for whom the goals of Tried up of late. Mind you, he does have 11 this season. Arsenal starting with the two up front. Eduardo, brilliant finish from the master marksman. And Arsenal are ahead inside a minute and a quarter. A New Year's Day hangover for West Ham. Is there a better finisher in the Premier League right now than Eduardo? His first home Premier League goal. Far too much space in which to turn and get the shot away. Fabregas had the glance, knew where he was. The chest strap took it away from the defender. The finish back across the goalkeeper. McCartney. Looking at Carlton Cole. There's a lot of chance here after the mistake by Hoyt to get a shot away. It drifted wide. A mistake by Hoyt. West Ham have the corner from it. Just nicked away off Colo Torre. Noble will take it. Ferdinand gets the foot on it. Blocked by Almunia. Clichy was there. Clichy well positioned. Oh, and it was deflected onto him too. Off Carlton Cole. Reflected in off Jungberg, but Fabregas was well placed. Ooh, given away by Abrua. Overconfident. This is Spectre. Back to Jungberg. Left foot. I mean, he got down well, well. I think it might have been going wide. The goalkeeper made sure. West Ham are fashioning chances now. May have been creeping in. And again, looks for Ferdinand Coles in there. Play back down to Upson. Never scored as an Arsenal player. And his first for West Ham on Saturday. West Ham beginning to show the form that has brought them just one away defeat in six games. Clichy to Krasicki. And Arsenal will be worried by those West Ham chances. Clichy. Added by Orr, chasing. Oh, beyond green. Well, he was gifted a goal and have a turn of the weekend and he's been gifted another one now. 2-0 to Arsenal after 17 minutes. That one slightly against the runner flag. Carnu-esque. Adebayor makes it Arsenal 2, West Ham United 0. Green to the edge of the penalty area. Should he have gone out that far with defenders back? Off the post, the slice of luck. Adebayor's 12th of the season. Panzer. Up to Cole. Mullins. Cole has stayed wide. Who's in the middle then? Well, Pencil's in there. Oh, that's a great effort. Acrobatics from the Ghanaian. Who's yet to score for West Ham. Never really got amongst the goals at Maccabi Tel Aviv or Hapoel Tel Aviv. West Ham United have had far more chances than Arsenal. Another long through ball by West Ham and Pats was chasing after it and he's got in and Almunia stood up to it. 
Pantsel actually looked around and appealed to the referee for something. Rosicki. Tomorrow comes forward and breaks into space. The crowd shouts, shoots, but he finds every way. Hits Spectre. Great raw weather. The referee unimpressed. And was this a handball by Spectre? Dipped his body. Difficult from that angle to see whether it was the upper arm or the uh, or the chest. Fabregas. He finds Ibue. And this is a strong run. Ferdinand blocked it. The Arsenal fans are ironically cheering handball every time one of their players touches it with the feet after moments ago appealing. Rosicki. Now Mullins. Neil in field. Collison. Always giving it away. And if I or beyond Spectre. He's seen the options played into everywhere. And it's Arsenal's first real effort since they scored their second goal. By all drops deep. He needs one of the midfield players to get forward in support. Colo Torre can bring this forward. Fabregas brings Hoyt into the play. Spectre got the block in, but it bounces Arsenal's way. Everway with a cross. Eduardo at the far post. Now, now was he pulled back or pushed? He claims. Lovely look there from Chris Foy, as if to say, what are you talking about? There was the cross, and well, that's what he was talking about. There was nothing wrong with Neil's challenge. Oh, but was he tucking on the shirt there? Upson. Collison. And he's bundled in the flag. Referee playing the advantage, Walcott. Collison got the touch on to Fabregas, and this is Adibayor. Went to bend it. Five of the last seven managers who've topped the table on New Year's Day morning have won the title. And now Clev. Cap in front of it. Motor into it, and he finds Rosicki. Poked at green, away by Collison. And that's the best we've seen from Arsenal in the second half. This could have been three. Cleb with a reverse ball. And the little poke as he stretched, saved by Green, who had such a good game here last year when West Ham won it. We did the job early and after we controlled the game. And in the first half, uh, West Ham created some uh, dangerous situations, especially on set pieces. But the uh, second half, it was uh, just control of the game from our part, and West Ham uh, was never dangerous. So, overall, I feel it's a deserved victory against a team who defended very well. I said to the players at half time that uh, we've come a long way and we've worked ever so hard, and they've got to go out in the second half and, and, and dig in. And that's what they've done. So, I'm pleased for, for that. But obviously, uh, it looked as if today really was a game one too many over the Christmas period for us. Had a moment. I'm working very hard and it's, it's pain on the pitch, so the most important thing for me now is keep on doing the good job. This means keep on scoring, keep on enjoying myself on the pitch. Those are the most important thing, you know. Do you prefer at this stage of the season to be chasseur or chasse, hunter or hunted? Hunted. Hunted because it's a big advantage. You uh, only rely on your own performances and that's a great luxury in our sport. Yeah, well, they're certainly hunted at the moment. Um, easy win, really, for us. I yeah. suppose it could have been different. West Ham had one or two chances, didn't they? West Ham certainly did have one or two chances, and I think that uh, Arsenal played a different way today. They played with two up front like they did at, uh, at Goodison against Everton with Adebayo and Eduardo. And the, the thing for West Ham as well, I mean, they were a, they were a goal down in, in no time whatsoever. Great, for, great bit of play, Fabregas on the left, ball in. Brilliant. Absolutely great technique for Eduardo. But then West Ham... Came back, and I think I think because they've got two up front a little bit, Arsenal, and they are getting used to it again. They were just a little bit sloppy. Uh, they had no great protection in front of the back four, 
And, and West Ham, in this period of play, should have actually got themselves level. Freddie Lundberg here back against his old team was a little bit unlucky. Arsenal knew they were winning. Mm. West Ham knew that they couldn't get back in. And that, and that was the end of the game. Sort of Alan Kirby Kirby. said that we looked mm. a bit Why, why sort do you of think um, Arsene Wenger's changed his tactics a bit? We don't customarily see him playing two up front. No, but it's not necessarily just a two up front. If, if you remember when he had Henri and Bergkamp, he had one, obviously, Bergkamp yeah. coming off. Adebayor does that. I think Eduardo likes to run in behind people, you've got Van Persie to come back in, you've got Bentner who's made a, mm. a great impression. And they're a little bit lucky with uh, Adebayor because his team Togo haven't qualified for the African Cup of Nations, so they, they don't miss him. It's just, it's just another well, that's option. That's all relevant, but Alan Shearer said after the Portsmouth match that Arsenal, no variation well, whatsoever. Hey, Arsenal's taking note and he's gone for two up front, a little bit of variation. He upset Arsenal, you know, Al. And he's the winning. Yeah. The proof right. of the food is like... He upset like him, didn't he? He's a bad man, that Shearer. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to win the championship, the way to apply pressure is win your matches 10 points out of 12 at Christmas. Yeah. That's applying pressure. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, next, let's see if Chelsea could keep their title aspirations alive. They pop down the road to face a Fulham side under new management. Behind the microphone at Craven Cottage was John Motson. Fulham have a new manager, and there isn't an Englishman with a wider CV than 60-year-old Roy Hodgson. He's had 16 jobs in eight different countries. He's managed in the World Cup finals and turned down a second stint at Inter Milan to meet the challenge of keeping Fulham in the Premier League. It's a tough call for Hodgson. They've only won two of their 20 games and have only beaten Chelsea once in 22 matches since 1979. Hodgson watched Saturday's 1-1 draw at Birmingham and saw Hamur Buatza red carded, so Moritz Boltz, himself back from suspension, comes into midfield. He makes one other change, Diamanski Camera preferred up front to David Healy. The only change in the Chelsea team is the inclusion of Steve Sidwell in midfield in place of Mikel. Wayne Bridge continues at left back in preference to Ashley Cole, and in the continued absence of so many senior players, Michael Ballack captains the side. Paul Chonchesky getting forward from left back. And a nice little ball tucked inside for Camera, and saved by Hilario, and Camera comes in again with Dempsey, and Mark Halsey says goal kick. Well, there was a moment of anxiety here for Chelsea. Good little ball in there from Konczewski to Diamanski Camera, and Hilario spilled it a bit. That's Michael Ballack. Now Joe Cole, Kalou wants it played through here. Stefanovic, oh, what a good effort by Kalou. Stefanovic was uh, shadowing him, but he got a shot in. It's a good little ball by Joe Cole to Kalou. Oof. Nice effort. This is Kalou. Oh, right Phillips is on the chase here. He's ahead of Konczewski. Sean right Phillips for Chelsea. Just past the far post. Konczewski was second in this foot race. Sean Wright Flint is away here. Not the greatest angle, but then again, not the greatest finish. Rather uh, dragged it across the uh, face of goal. Well, Roy Hodgson hasn't yet taken a training session. He watched one uh, yesterday, taken by his staff. But he'll be on the training ground on a daily basis from now on, I can tell you that. This is camera. And on this side is Volts. Turns inside Bridge, Morris for Oh, Joe Cole with the tackle. Penalty to Fulham. After just nine minutes of Roy Hodgson's first game in charge, Fulham have a penalty. It was Joe Cole on Moritz Volts, and Mark Holsey didn't need to think twice. There is contact. And Danny Murphy has stepped forward here to take the kick. Well, this could be a big moment for Fulham. And a good start for Roy Hodgson. Danny Murphy tucks away the penalty, cool as you like. And Fulham have taken the lead against their West London neighbours. In the end, Hilario went the wrong way. And a round of applause from the new boss. Dempsey, or oh. well, he withstood one challenge, <laughs> and then uh, Ben Haim clattered in the second time. So it's a free kick to Fulham. 
and Danny Murphy, who took that penalty earlier, has also in the past been something of a free kick specialist. This is Murphy. Decent effort. Probably a technical kind of player who might appeal to Roy Hodgson, Danny Murphy. But it's so far so good for Fulham that they have dropped 19 points this season from winning positions, losing the lead on a frequent basis. This is Wright Phillips. There's appeal for handball against Stefanovic. Mark Holsey looks across to his linesman. And it doesn't look to me as though he's given it. Well, you have to ask yourself, was that intentional from Stefanovic? Well, ball to arm, maybe. That's what Mark Holsey and his linesman obviously feel. Ashley Cole not selected today, not even in the 16. Belletti. Looking for Kalu. Mikel's made a run forward too, and so at Essien. They're getting men up now, Chelsea, far more than in the first half. Right, Phillips. This is Belletti. Corner. Well, you just wonder here whether Fulham are going to have the resilience to hold on. Alex is up again. Away. That is Alex. Kalu! And Chelsea have equalised. It's no big surprise. Solomon Kalu got the header in. And it's 1-1. And it's the same old story for Fulham. They cannot seem to hold a lead. Alex headed it back across the six-yard box. And Solomon Kalu applied the finishing touch. The man who got the winner against Newcastle on Saturday, equalises here for Chelsea. It's his seventh of the season, and again, it's a sorry second-half tale for Fulham. Essien. Balak. Kalu and Wright Phillips on the chase again here. Joe Cole. Feels for handball against Koncheski. Chelsea have a free kick. Koncheski's protesting, but uh, I think on this occasion, Mike Tingey on the near side did say handball. Belletti will take this free kick. Now then, player's gone down, penalty. Well, it looked like a tug, really, on the shirt of Balak and... Uh, it looks like Dempsey to me that brought down Michael Ballack. And so, at the same end where Danny Murphy put Fulham ahead from the penalty spot, Chelsea now have a chance to take the lead in similar circumstances. Oh, no mistake there. The Germans know how to take penalties, don't they? Michael Ballack with his uh, second goal of the season. And it's 2-1 Chelsea, and Fulham have caved in again, having held the lead at half-time. Oh, it's Balak now. Bridge made the interception, and Balak has got brought down here by Dejan Stefanovic, the Fulham captain, and I think he's going to get a yellow card here. The first of the game, with uh, 21 minutes gone in the second half. On the ball, we've got uh, Balak, Mikel, Bridge and Alex. Any one of four. And it was Balak. Oh, that was close. Well, his reaction suggests it was mighty close. Stefanovic. by Dempsey for Healy, and Healy tries his luck from the corner of the penalty area. We've seen him score from there before for Northern Ireland, but not today for Fulham. But it will need something uh, out of the blue like this if Fulham are going to rescue the game. In the middle is Kalu. Two Fulham defenders covering him. Oh, not a very good header by Bocanegra. Pizarro should have made it three. It was virtually his first contribution after coming on, and he hasn't scored. Claudio Pizarro since the opening weekend of the season against Birmingham for Chelsea. But he had a chance there if he could have got that volley on target. Always when we play one o'clock like we play against uh, Aston Villa, we are not coming to the second to the first half. First half was not good. 
even if we had two good chances, uh, one against one of the goalkeeper to make 1-0 or 1-1, but we didn't play good. It's not the football that I like. But second half, we play, we show a lot of character and more of this good football. We dominate the game, score two goals. I think we can score more. So it was uh, nice for us today. I'm a little bit disappointed because in free play, I thought that we, we worked hard and our defensive shape was quite good and we did really restrict them to very few chances in free play. But uh, unfortunately, set plays are also part of the game and that's, that's what cost us a game. It's a pleasure to be captain uh, for Chelsea in this time, but uh, more important is that we, we win the game, that we come to uh, through this difficult time period because we have a lot of injured player. And uh, you know, always in, in Christmas time, New Year is a difficult time, a lot of games. So we want to be close to the top. And uh, yeah, our last two games was good. I'm quite looking forward to the fact that we now have at least 10 days or 11 days before we play West Ham. And there will be a lot of discussions in that time, A, about what we need to do on the training field, how we can improve things by, by working with the players. And B, of course, we can't rule out the fact that if the right players are available for transfer, who will help us not only in the short term but the long term, then I know we're going to be interested. Well, we'll sort of see about mm. in a moment. But um, Chelsea <coughs> made a little bit harder work of it than United or Arsenal, but... It was, it was it. vintage, Chelsea. A lot of players missing. It's long, hard... Christmas programme, but I always felt right for the word go that Chelsea were going to win the game yeah. simply because it Fulham were wide open. They really are no defensive cover in front or behind and gaps right through the middle. So as I say, it was no surprise when Chelsea equalised and then went in front and invariably uh, they could have finished three or four up. Well, I mean, Fulham don't seem to have a problem getting into the lead. It's maintaining that's the problem. I mean, you intimated that they're wide open. Is that their problem? Oh, well, a shadow of a doubt. I mean... Defensive play, back four plays, position, position, position. And you take as a slight when it's hit between your two centre-backs or your centre-back and your full-back. If, if it's going bump, bump, bump and it's 10 yards away it's going past you, then that's all right. But when it's 30 or 40 yards, yeah. you've got a major problem. And this is um, the game against Birmingham where they're 1-0 up. You watch the shaded area here. No cover whatsoever in front of the back four here. That area, wide open. And they're 1-0 up front, right? And then so... You don't want it played there or there. You've got to try and cover those areas. But look at that. You've got a train through there. Larson comes in. And all right, they might say a little bit unlucky because of the deflection and it goes past the keeper. But today, this is the same thing. I mean, you know, the fullback on one side, the fullback on the other side, it's like 40 yards between the yeah. two of them. Right, Phillips gets in there. Could easily go on the back of the net. And then here, Bock and Egra, you take your position. Everybody in the back four has got to take his position off of him. He's like four or five yards too far that way. When it's played past him, Kalu's in there just as well he's offside because it's a penalty kick. There's the area he should be in. If he's in that area, he just stands there and heads it. And it's, you know, it ain't rocket science. I mean, we've said time and time and time about the function you do as a back four. How mm. difficult it is to score against you if yeah. you get four players in position? That's what it's all about. In a, as a unit, and that's yeah. what they've got to try and do. Yeah, the, the top three appear to be pulling clear. Liverpool drop points again. Can we rule them out? I think it'll be very, very, very hard to displace um, Manchester United and Arsenal. I think that Chelsea it's not. Got it's their not problems with injuries, players. Yeah, well, Chelsea, if, you get, if you get everybody years. back, and you've got to remember that Chelsea have got the, the big three to come at Stamford Bridge yet, mm. and Liverpool will be there or thereabouts. But at the moment, you'd be looking and you'd be saying Manchester United and Arsenal. Yeah. I think if you look at today's games, the top three haven't played particularly well. But what have they done? Mm, yeah, yeah. They've all yeah, won. They've all won. Yeah. It's a difference. Well, it's New Year. It's a good time to ask you. How do you how do you see it panning out? Who's going to win it? Manchester United for me. I have to agree with that, I'm afraid. Oh, two of you, both of you. <laughs> to argue about. Uh, before we bring you the remaining three games, let me put you in the picture regarding our FA Cup coverage this weekend. It all kicks off with focus on Saturday, BBC One at 10 past 12. Press your red button for score from 2.30. News of every goal as it goes in. Final score is on BBC One at half past four. Just after that, our first live FA Cup third round tie gets underway. Should be a belter. Aston Villa versus Manchester United. BBC One at five past five. And that's followed by highlights of all the day's ties at 10.45. For Sunday lunch, compliment your roast beef or lasagna uh, with Burnley against Arsenal. BBC One, 1.45. Then we'll round off with Stoke versus Newcastle, 5.45 for that one. Back to today's action, the late kickoff almost guaranteed goals. The games featuring Aston Villa and Spurs this season have reaped a total of 138 goals. At Villa Park for us, Guy Mowbray. 
There's an England number one at either end of the field here, and they can expect to be busy the way these two teams have been scoring. Four for Dimitar Berbatov on Saturday, but since then his agent's words about wanting a move have angered many Spurs fans. Bronk just too quick for Petrov, but gives it away to Barry. And Bonlahor being squeezed out by Kabul and Lee, but still managed to get to the ball. Petrov. Chance there for more. Well, he was able to get it under control, turn and fire. And Luke Moore off target. Been low key so far. Moore tackled by Malbranc. Down he goes, and it's going to be the first yellow card of the evening. Malbranc came in stamping down. It's a pretty nasty challenge. Barry, easily dealt with by Yung Kyo Lee. Malbranc has to be careful here. Gareth Barry beat him to it. Now Petrov. Difficult one to defend. Larson! Oh dear, what a miss! It's a glaring miss from the defender who's already scored four times this season, twice against Spurs. And he should have put this one away. He had the time to set himself, but he went to try and hammer it. No defenders in his way, admittedly, but Martin O'Neill knows that's one that's got away that shouldn't have done. Two sides step the referee. And he's furious that Steve Tanner was in his way. Petrov. Well, I haven't really made the most of that in terms of the pace of this attack. Still could come to something. It is a free kick for Aston Villa. And even more frustration for the Germany under 21 international Kevin Prince Boateng. Young in, that's Milberg! Well, you did get the feeling it was coming for Villa from a free kick or a corner. And five minutes before half-time, it has. And Melberg standing all alone to head his second goal of the season. Combination of... Dawson and Boateng lost their bearings. Melberg found the corner. Martin O'Neill's men lead 1 0. That is free kick goes to Spurs. Their turn to try to put pressure. Came to Dawson. Now it's Berbatov. Straight against Carson. Perhaps I'm doing the goalkeeper a disservice, it might just be a very good save. Carson stood up all the time. Bon Lahore. Dawson, that wasn't a cleanly hit back pass. Robinson gives it away to Barry. This is Luke Moore now. Up against Lee. Luke Moore's shot is high and wide, it was wild. And Jameen Genus will be as relieved as anybody. It's his miscontrol that, uh, indirectly or otherwise, led to that chance, such as it was for Villa. Oh, it was challenging. And it's off him for the corner. Inside involves Melberg and Larson again, and Davis who attacked that. Barry. Berbatov semi closes him down. This is Petrov, and that's Luke Moore missing a sitter. Well, Villa have had chances before and after Melberg's goal. And Luke Moore just didn't really connect properly. Don't think he'll get a better chance all day. Berbatov. Baumer tries to hold him up. Played across for Robbie Keane. Larson with the challenge. Now Malbronk. 
It's fired wide. Spurs protest. All that might happen is that Robbie Keane could get caution. I don't know, there's a lot in it. For me, Davis blocks his effort beautifully. Zakora. O'Hara. Berbatov. Little touch in for Robbie Keane. Dawson. Defoe jumps. Berbatov's touch. Jermaine Defoe's in. And Jermaine Defoe equalises. It's been coming. Berbatov involved. Robbie Keane has made a difference in this second half. And it bounced up beautifully for Jermaine Defoe. And the finish was pretty special too. Lightning quick reactions in ahead of Baumer. Carson was a spectator. Top in the corner. Six minutes to go. Larson against Jamie O'Hara. Good delivery from Barry. It's Larson! That might well be the match winner. And once again, Spurs concede from a simple set piece. Once again, they equalise, only to fall behind almost immediately. First half, Dawson lost Melbourne. Goal. Second half, O'Hara loses Larson. 2 1 Villa. You got through the holiday period unbeaten, and you start 2008 in the top six. Can't be bad. Well, that's, it's. I mean, it's uh, it's a fantastic effort by the players. You know, they, their heart and soul is in the game. They could play with a commendable spirit, obviously, but they play with uh, great ability as well too. And uh, we had to dig it out. I said earlier against a side that's that's going particularly well at the moment, and for us to win tonight was big for us. I think we played really well. Uh, first half we played well, and. And we, we continued in, in the second half. They got a goal, but we still believed that we could score. And uh, I, was, I was so happy to, to get the winning goal. We've all been reading about Dimitar Berbatov this morning. I guess that hasn't helped your preparation for this game. Can you tell us what the story is with him? What's the latest? What's the truth? For, for, for us, it's, it's nothing. It's nothing. Uh, it's going to be many, many rumours during this, this uh, month. Uh, but about Berba, is nothing in there. He's uh, probably his agent. And I would say most of the agents now, they're going to be talking and giving you, all of you, some rumours to put in the papers on TV. But uh, from club, uh, from, uh, from, from the chairman to us, it's, it's nothing in there. It's a Tottenham player. If we want to get better, and I'm, I mean better in terms of uh, being, being a better club, we need to keep him. They want to keep him as well, Tottenham. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, think, I think he's an outstanding player, fantastic touch. The problem is, on some days, he doesn't look like he's particularly bothered. I honestly feel if, if one of the, the big teams came in for him and the money was right, I think Tottenham would sell him because he would insist that he wanted to go. I'd love to see him in one of the big teams. I'm not kidding you. Best first touch in the Premier League. anti Spurs. What do you mean? No, no, just, just because. No, 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 no. Big no, 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 no. Team, big team, but I'm saying, and, and a team that's going really well and, and that are really flying. Like, can you imagine him in, in Arsenal and Man United? Not particularly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, more immediate um, problems, perhaps, for Spurs. Than, yeah. Uh, their defensive. Pretty well, well they're, just, they're, just, they're just not learning from some of the situations, Gary. It, it's, it's absolutely frightening. And, Free kick comes in, and it's just it's just so easy. Two of the Tottenham players, every, everything's fine there. It's not a great problem. Watch this: the two, just Dawson and, and Botain just run into each other, and it's the easiest of headers. It's awful. The winning goal, you know, not decent movement. You wouldn't say it's brilliant. Free header. I mean, this was driving them absolutely mad. This was Saturday against Reading. Robinson decides to come out to punch set piece again. Easy goal to concede. This was, I think, October against uh, Villa at Tottenham, and it ju it's just a comedy of errors. And it's almost week in, week out that we're seeing goals like this being conceded by Tottenham. Looks a little bit harsh on the goalkeeper there, but you know, just as a team defensively, yeah. still, they're still, all over the place. Still, Berbatov and by four centre backs. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you. Do. It's, it's crazy about, uh, because yeah. they are the to me they are the only team. 
Tottenham yeah. are the only team that can possibly break into break the top into four. I think, I think the, front, well, the front four yeah. are really good. Mm. Yeah. Front four. So, and, you know, he said before, defensively, it, it's not that yeah. difficult to sort it out, but... Golly, that needs but some Aston sorting Miller out. Seem to have mm. got things sorted. I think a good run. Yeah, a good run. Work in progress. Work very hard. Pace in the right areas. Still needs a couple of players, I'm sure, and they might even address that situation in January. But they're only going up, Aston yeah. Villa. And a lovely game to come on Saturday. Yeah. And the cup against Man United. Oh yeah, yeah. We'll look forward to mm. that one. Uh, next up, it's uh, Middlesbrough against Everton. Borough fared well at home against the Toffees in recent times, losing just once in their last eight meetings. Far more interesting is the fascinating fact that Everton's first half record this season is bettered only by Manchester United. Alistair Mann was at the Riverside. Tunchai's four goals in December and Middlesbrough ten points, half his side season total. Yakuba returns to the Riverside for the first time since his August departure. Andy Johnson's in for the suspended Mikel Arteta, while Nuno Valente and James McFadden deputise for the injured Cahill and Yobo. Now Tunchai's onside here. He's overdone that with a touch and Howard came out very, very quickly. Downing, Howard getting back into position again. So too, Jagielka. And it just opened up for Tunchai, but uh, though the offside flag stayed down, his touch deserted him. And he's ended up with a hefty blow as Tim Howard came out at speed to thwart him. Well, this time last year, Gareth Southgate began 2007 with a five-match unbeaten run, which began with three straight wins. They'll be hoping for a happy new year this time too. Lockenbach. Young. Patient build-up by Middlesbrough. Young on the overlap, and it's a decent teasing ball in, and Dowling, goodness me, he... Whipped it from one side of the goal, past both posts and beyond. Did well to get any kind of angle on it, it's not over yet. Howard gathers it in. Well, Phil Jagielka was back on the line as Young delivered the ball in towards Downing. And Downing struck him with his cross shot. Everton will also want to prove that without Tim Cahill they can still find the goal with regularity. The likes of Johnson and Yakubu will surely prove that he is not the only man who can score and Tunchai is a player who can always find the net for Middlesbrough and had that ball been something that he hit rather than hitting him then maybe we would have had the opening goal. Nuno Valente up towards McFadden, who trapped it neatly and tried to bring in Pinar. Yakubu! Well, he never got over the top of it. And that ball was always rising off his right boot. Downing. Arca. Nice ball. Tunchai. John Gook Lee has made a run to the far side and it won't quite reach him, maybe O'Neill, great save by Howard, really good save that by the Everton goalkeeper. Well, it was Tunchai who had the first opportunity striding into the Everton penalty area. And he does tumble as he tries to get his shot away. Well, it was an interesting one, wasn't it? Jagielka certainly caught him a little on the way through but there wasn't much in the way of fierce protests when Mike Riley didn't point to the spot well Gary O'Neill was all ready to celebrate his first Middlesbrough goal and he would have done but for some terrific goalkeeping Kubu Pinar Johnson it's opened up for Johnson and he's tucked it in To the delight of those who've made the trip from Merseyside behind the goal. Pinar Johnson, just the slightest of angles, and he found the corner beyond Schwarzer. It's his fifth goal of the season, his fourth in the Premier League.
And in the absence of Tim Cahill today, Johnson has taken the opportunity to show that he will find the back of the net when there's a chance to do so. What a bonus that is for David Moyes in a game of few chances. They've taken the first of them. Only Derby have scored fewer than Middlesbrough this campaign, and uh, they're going to need at least one today. Here's Downing, who switched wings. Thumped away by Lescott, and it breaks quite favourably for Everton here with McFadden. Johnson to the right, Yakubu far side on the left. Here's Peanut. Middlesbrough have regrouped. Everton still have possession. Neville. Carsley! It was precise, but it was just off target. He was very deliberate with the way that he hit this. His body shape and the way he side-footed it, trying to just bend it beyond Schwarzer. Here's Pienaar. Pogatetz gets there in front of Johnson. Downing, given away. McFadden, Yakubu screaming for it. Yakubu's waiting. Johnson, McFadden, 2 0 Everton. Game one, surely. Well, he was the scorer when Everton last won here at the Riverside in April 2006. He got the only goal that day. I suspect he's guaranteed three points with the second today. Back in the side and doing what he likes to do for Scotland on a regular basis, finding the back of the net. And amidst the celebrations, he was pointing with his armband. A former Motherwell employee, of course, he feels, I'm sure, the tragedy of his friend, Phil O'Donnell. For some reason, I knew I was going to score because I, I had it planned that that would be my celebration. And I, uh, I'd just like to dedicate my goal to Phil and his uh, family and uh, just to let them know I'm thinking about them. We had uh, some good bits of fortune at the right moment, but uh, I, have to, I have to praise the players. You know, they, We had a defeat the other day there, which... Uh, we're disappointed with. We've come up here with, with a lot of injured players and uh, the boys have put on a great show. We've, we had no midfield players available hardly today, so, so it was a great three points. We didn't get the win today, but uh, they've got to stay strong together and we've got to make sure that we, we keep everybody going and keep their enthusiasm because it's, that's the thing that can suffer when you keep uh, getting beaten, especially at home. Another fine performance uh, from Everton, battling side. I mean, lost to United mm. and Arsenal recently, but apart from that, they haven't lost in eons. Yeah, I mean, I like them. I think they've got a really nice battle. Good goalkeeper, strong defensively, creative in the middle of the park. Arteta, who didn't play today, and up front, Yakubu and Johnson, lots of pace and strength there. You know, so things are going great for Moyes and his men. Yeah, as for Middlesbrough, I mean, it was, it was always going to be important who scored the first goal. Well, I think Gareth Southgate game. said that after the match, you know, the first goal was mega yeah. because of the hard Christmas programme. and. And Borough had a chance here, don't you? Jag Elka comes after him. You know, the tackle, nowhere near the ball. Should he have gone down? Could he have been a little bit more clever? Possibly. Obviously doesn't take the penalty. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, I think Howard makes a wonder save after that. And, and then Evan got the... The part and score the opening goal, and, and that was the difference. He might just be honest, Tunchai, mightn't he? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the first one he's going to say. The first one. <laughs> we, sh we shall applaud honesty. Our final game this evening sees Reading attempt to beat Portsmouth for the first time in 10 years. The last time they met earlier this season, it was 7 4. You can assume by the fact it's on last that there was no repeat. Uh, watching at the Medeski <laughs> Stadium was Martin Fisher. Two more goals for Dave Kitson on Saturday took him up to eight for the season. Despite the 6-4 defeat at Spurs, Steve Coppel names the same side. Glenn Johnson returns for Portsmouth at right back. Their top scorer, Ben Jarni, got a hat-trick when these sides met at Fatton Park back in September. Montari. Just the right weight on that ball, and Ben Johnny is in behind Sonko, and surely that's a penalty. Yes, it is. No hesitation in the mind of Mike Dean, the referee. What further punishment awaits the Reading number five, though? It's the red card. What a dreadful start to the new year for Sonko and Reading. 
quality through ball here from Montari. The weight was perfect. Benjani in behind Sonko, who got on the wrong side of him. It was a clumsy challenge. The question is, was he the last man? Nico Cranchar, the Croat, has been given the responsibility of beating Hanneman from the spot. The stutter, and he's hit the post and missed it. And Reading survive. Relief all around the Modeski, swung up back in by Montari. Well, Nico Cranchar looked ever so relaxed as he came up to take this kick. Hanneman not put off by the stutter. And it strikes the foot of the post. Doyle, what a good run away from two. Comfy is there! Whisk away. What a response from Reading. Excellent work by Doyle, the cross just behind Kitson, but Convey was arriving. Just couldn't quite steer it in the far post. Good the off, shallow by Harper. Decision given by assistant referee Simon Beck on the far side. The incident was right under his nose. Harper with the foul on Buba Diop. Campbell, Distan, Haradis and all up from the back to attack this free kick that Montari whips in. Hanneman's lost it. And it's smuggled home. And it's Sol Campbell. Regulation catch for Marcus Hanneman. And the American got it completely wrong. They don't come much easier than this to grab hold of, no pressure at all, what a fumble. And Campbell just gets a toe on the end of it. Reading felt that there might have been a handball here. Did it just brush the top of his left arm? French up, a Ryderson. Portsmouth with two in the box, it's a great chance, it's a terrible header by Buber Diop. And so Ryderson tees it in, it's two against two. And Bubidi Op just can't control the header. Well, Steve Koppel has already come down to the dugout to try and reorganise his players who haven't woken up defensively from the nightmare at White Hart Lane on Saturday. Doyle for Reading. Only Hunt ahead of him. Here is Hunt. And Doyle's in again. It's Doyle for Reading. Oh! Off James. And wide of the post. Hunt was involved. And Doyle almost squeezes it beyond James. And but for James's right leg, I think this would have found the bottom corner. Tari finding new target. Johnson to his right. Portsmouth have four in the penalty area. Johnson teasing Shoy this way and that. Chips it in. And headed on the against the bar by Benjani. And the rebound by Horidison into the chest of Hanneman. Oh, what a chance for Portsmouth to double their lead on the stroke of half-time. Excellent approach work by Johnson. Almost the right winger there as he bamboozled Shorey, dinks it up, free header for Benjani. And Hanneman in the right place. Johnson. Utaka's pace against the speed of Shorey. Only one winner in that. Utaka here around Hanneman. Joy for the travelling Pompey fans. John Utaka with his first goal in two months. And surely that settles it at the Modeski. Here, it's a sprint between Utaka and Shorey. Shorey no slouch, but Utaka is so, so quick and calmly takes the ball beyond Hanneman. And strokes it home for the killer. Second goal for Portsmouth. Utaka. Works it nicely to Johnson. Thinks about the shot here, lets it go. It's a good stop by Hanneman. That was travelling. Hanneman going down smartly to his right to turn that away. 
Johnson having a glance there and just thinking, why not? This is Hunt away from Montari. Kicks him to his right, long through the middle. Harper has taken up a good position as well. This is Dela Cruz swinging the ball in. And a chance for Kitson, maybe. Long was in there too, and Distan able to clear. Well, James came for this cross, but no, went near to it. Immediately after the f first whistle, we're down to ten men, and you know, thankfully they never scored from the penalty. But it was always going to be a hell of an uphill struggle from there, and you know, a mistake led to the first goal, and you know, 80 minutes. Um, with ten men is not a good idea. You thought you'd escape when uh, Cranshaw strikes the post, but uh, then a horrible moment for yourself. Yeah, I just uh, whipped in cross, and um, you know, it got runners coming in and everything, and you know, I just should have punched it, and you know, I tried to hold it, and um, you just pay the price. We've been on uh, John for a, a few weeks now to uh, start delivering, and uh, he can finish the kid, but um, and he's got great pace. Uh, we just need to see it a little bit more often. Well, it wasn't a great start for Reading, was it, really? Um, worse, sending worse. off in the first couple of minutes. What did you make of it? Um, well, I don't think there's any argument whatsoever here that Sonko just basically upends your man and he's gone. There's, there is absolutely no argument about it. It's just a daft what? thing to do. Yeah, it's completely daft. So, you know, I think Stevie Cobble says, and you've got 80 plus minutes and you, 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 just, you can't chase the game. What I will say about Reading, they, they never, never made a great fuss about Shady this. Should have punched it, should have caught it. Well, should have caught it would have been easier, but. So Campbell, it was actually offside, but they, they made no great deal about it. Reading, they probably thought it was more handball than offside, but it was definitely offside. But Portsmouth needed the win. I think Reading's home form, obviously, is okay. a key to keeping up there. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, take a look at the Barclays Premier League table. The title hopefuls maintain the status quo with Arsenal remaining two points clear of Manchester United and Chelsea a further four points behind. Liverpool with two games in hand find themselves 13 points off the top prior to the visit of Wigan. Everton and Villa move above Manchester City who face a trip to Newcastle. Derby are in desperate need of victory at Bolton. The Rams are eight points adrift of free-falling Fulham. Roy Hodgson's new side were the only club in the bottom five to play on New Year's Day. None of the sides in the bottom half managed a point. Well, that's it from us. A new year, but nothing new about the top three from all of us here. Good night.